don't you act like gentlemen and let these ladies eat first? The ladies eat. Who's gotta eat too? Listen, here is another highly requested review and y'all, I have to admit, I was not ready for how this film would hit me at this big age. This movie went way over my head when I was younger. The relationship between Brenda and Doughboy and how it differed from her relationship with Ricky. Are we ready to talk about it? Are we ready to go there? Listen, while watching this movie, I noticed a lot of things and it's finally time to talk about it. So child, let's get into it. So the movie opens up to us being in South Central LA in 1984. This is where we meet our main character, Trey. We see him walking with other neighborhood kids as they begin to talk about the shooting that happened overnight. One member of their friend group leads them to the aftermath of the overnight shooting where they see leftover blood, tissue, Reagan Bush posters, and other things. It is made clear that seeing things like this has become normal for where they live. Later on, we go to all of them being in class and they are being taught the origins of Thanksgiving. And of course, they aren't being taught the reality of what happened, but the fairy tale that we were all taught coming up. And being that Trey has been taught the true history of Thanksgiving and other things, Trey is not as open to learning the lies as the other students, which leads him to act out and be a distraction. When his teacher challenges him to come up and teach the class, he accepts and goes up to share some factual knowledge. He tells the class about how all people originated from Africa and this kid, his friend, proceeds to tell him he doesn't come from Africa, he's from Crenshaw. And Trey gets irritated with him, which leads to them going back and forth. And listen, they were going in. Punk, I'll kick your ass. I'll get my brother and shoot you in the face. Get your punk ass Trey. brother, bitch. I get my daddy. Trey. At least I got one, motherfucker. And I mean, cussing like some grown ass men, child. And then we go to Trey's mom, Reva, getting a phone call from the teacher detailing how her son acted up that day. And what bothered me about this whole interaction is that instead of being truly concerned and trying to come up with a solution for Trey, the teacher tries to push her stereotypes onto Trey's mother. There's some problem in the home. Uh, are you employed? Trey is going to live with his father. His father? Yes, his father. Or did you think we made babies by ourselves? This conversation made me want to come through the TV. I was triggered. But Trey comes in and before he could even lay his backpack down, his mom pulls out a contract he signed that stated that the next time he acted out in school, he would have to go stay with his dad. Honestly, I love the contract idea. Such a great way to teach accountability. But since he didn't abide by their contract, it's time for Trey to go to his dad's. On the way there, his mom tells him that she loves him and that this will be for his good, being that she doesn't want to see him dead or in the streets. She wants better for him. Another thing that I liked about this, making sure he knew that she was doing this out of love. But as Trey makes it to his dad's, his mother and father talk as he talks to the neighborhood kids. His parents work together so well. A plus co-parenting. Before his mom pulls off, she tells him that this stay is temporary while she finishes school, gets a better job, and finds a better place to stay. While they're talking, his dad, Furious, that's his name by the way, tries to get Doughboy and his homeboy to rake his lawn for $5. And they was not with it. So of course, this falls on Trey and he has to do it for the free. Polar Tink Tink. Damn your daddy me. You worse than the boogeyman himself. Later on, Furious tells him the rules of the house. He tells him he has to clean up his room and bathroom and whatever else. Upon receiving the list of his new responsibilities, Trey asks his dad this. Dad, can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. What do you have to do around here? I don't have to do nothing around here except for pay the bills, put food on the table, and put clothes on the back. You understand? 
Furious tells Trey that he's not trying to be hard on him and that he's trying to teach him how to be responsible and give him structure, unlike his little friends across the street. He tells him that he loves him and then tells him to get ready for bed. Overnight, as Furious and Trey are asleep, an intruder tries to come in and Furious attempts to take him out, scaring Trey half to death. But lucky for the intruder, Furious misses his shot. Somebody must have been praying for that fool. I swear I ain't right for his head. Should've blew it off. Child, Furious waited an hour before the cops showed up, and when they did, they asked stupid questions. Well, somebody broke into the house, I fired at him with my piece, and he ran away. So you didn't get him? Well, the and then this bastard says this. You know it's too bad you didn't get him. Be one less nigga out here in the streets we have to worry about. Listen, all skin folk ain't kin folk. I won't let him shake my kid's hand either. Dude showed up to an intruder scene with coffee and a donut in his hand. What the hell? But remember this face. He will make a reappearance. So anyway, we meet Doughboy and Ricky's mom, Brenda. Now, let me say this. I knew his mama wasn't the best mom, but now at my big age, I see that his mama won shit. She was toxic as hell to Doughboy. See, Doughboy was the black sheep or the scapegoat and Ricky was the golden child. How can you talk to your child like this and expect greatness to come from that? Just like your dad. You don't do shit and you never go to mouth to shit. But anyway, the kids go off to get into some trouble which leads them to seeing this. I feel like a dog died. <laughs> Look like Freddy Cougar got him. And before they could leave out, the crew walks up asking Ricky for his ball. He gives them the ball being that he doesn't want to rock the boat. And Doughboy, being the great big brother that he is, was not going for it. So he goes up to them to try and take the ball back. He eventually gets it after being smacked down to the ground for it. Turns out Ricky's dad gave him that ball and Doughboy knew how much it meant to him. They eventually get it back though because this guy felt bad for him. We fast forward to Furious and Trey having some quality father and son time. Furious is again giving Trey some keys to life. What's the three rules? Always look a person in the eye. Two words, to never be afraid to ask you for anything. To never respect anybody who doesn't respect you back. They even go into some sex talk. While Trey is only thinking about the act of sex and what can come from it, Furious tells him it's much more to it than what he currently knows. Furious goes on to tell him that he was only 17 when Trey was born and how he chose to be better for him. He also advises him not to go into the army since black people have no place in it. When Trey makes it back to the hood, he sees Doughboy and his friend getting put in the back of a cop car. Turns out they were caught stealing and are being taken to jail. Whole kids going to jail, child. But yeah, we fast forward seven years later, Trey and his friends are teenagers now. Ricky has become a dad. Doughboy and his friends are still doing what they do best. This guy and this pacifier, out of all things. But Doughboy and his homeboys do a good deed and give him a much needed sex talk. Cause this dude was on the verge of going out super sad. You be fucking no dope heads. I might let him suck my dick. Man, they got AIDS and shit. Stupid motherfucker, don't you know you can catch that shit from letting them suck on your dick too? Thank you. Trey finally makes it to the party. And after all these years, this shirt is still so fly to me. The whole fit really. But he makes a pit stop over to Doughboy at the urging of his mom. Apparently, Doughboy just got out of jail and he's trying his best on his own to turn his life around. He's been reading. His homeboys were real shocked about that one since they pretty much thought he hadn't read anything his whole life. And he was working out, taking steps to not go back to jail. We love to hear and see it. We then go over to the mother of Ricky's son, Shanice, Trey's boo, Brandy, and their homegirls. Child, Shalika was slick trying to holler at Trey, but Brandy shut this shit down real quick. Mm. Do he got a girlfriend? Yes. <laughs> Child, anyway, the fool was finally ready, and these men were so rude, not letting the women or kids eat first. 
Listen, nobody taught them manners or how to be gentlemen, but thankfully, Trey was there to lead the way, I guess. So, later on, he takes a plate over to his dad. He asks him to line him up after he eats, and they end up having another one of their father-son talks. When Trey brings up how Furious is getting older and how one day he'll be hanging out with his grandkids, Furious takes this as a sign that Trey has been doing some grown-up things. So now it's time for the upgraded sex talk. Child, Trey tells his daddy a very embellished story of his first sexual experience. So, Trey meets this girl. She comes up to him spitting game and he spits some as well. So one thing leads to another. Her mama and grandma leave out for church and she calls Trey over. When he gets there, they go upstairs to, well, you already know. Yeah. But surprise, the girl's mom comes home, senses that there's some adult things going on, and heads upstairs to regulate. But Trey ends up escaping before he could get got. Turns out Trey didn't even use a rubber, cause she told him she was on the pill. Now, I know his daddy taught him better than that, but that's the thing about kids and teens. You can give them the handbook, but they have the free will to choose to use it or not. And his ass should have used it because he's worrying about a baby and not the plethora of diseases he could have exposed himself to. And baby, after this discussion, his daddy was pissed. I would be too, honestly. Anyway, we go to Ricky and Trey heading off to school. Trey tells Ricky about the talk him and his daddy had and it turns out the little story he told his dad was a whole lot. Why did he feel like he had to lie to his dad about sex of all things? But it turns out Trey is scared to have sex and Brandy is not trying to have sex anytime soon so doing the do is not on the horizon for him. But that doesn't mean he's not planning to do it eventually. We then go to him and Brandy having their little argument. Apparently, Trey been playing games, basically trying to manipulate Brandy, telling his daddy to tell her that he's not there when she calls, other times taking the phone off the hook, all because he's mad that Brandy is not interested in giving it up to him. And to be honest, during their argument, Brandy made valid points. Technically, it don't make no difference whether we do it now or later, we're still gonna get married, right? Yeah, but I want to go to college before I get married, and there ain't no guarantee that I'm going to marry you. Meanwhile, Doughboy and his friends are still getting into a little trouble. Dude really walked up to him and snatched his shit. Like he had a whip to run to and escape. Bad decisions. We go back to Trey, still trying to manipulate Brandy. When he finally accepts that his so-called game won't work, he goes soft and tries another angle. Now he back on the phone talking sweet nothings like he should have been doing all alone. <laughs> Listen. But anyway, Trey's mom calls on the other line so he ends the convo with Brandy and switches over to her. It appears that his mama has done what she said she was going to do. She's found a better job, found a better place to live, and now she wants Trey to come live with her. When she brings it up to Trey, Trey brushes her off which leads Reva to ask to talk to Furious. And of course, when Furious suggested Trey make his own decisions, Reva wasn't trying to hit it, and they start arguing over the phone. We then go to Doughboy, who's chilling at the house with his homeboys. They see a car creeping, and of course, they think the worst, but they soon realize that it's a recruiter coming to see Ricky. When the recruiter comes in, Brenda turns on the charm, baby, and quickly clears out the living room so that the recruiter and Ricky can talk. While they're chatting, the recruiter brings up a great point about Ricky having a plan B since the chances of going pro are pretty slim. Ricky tells him that he could go into business with Trey or work on computers, but honestly, I don't think Ricky had any plans. This dude had a 2.3 GPA, a 2.3, and he needed to make a 700 on the SAT to have a chance at being recruited. This dude was just showing up to class. <laughs> no effort whatsoever. We then go to Trey, Brandy, and Ricky taking the SAT, and baby Ricky was struggling. He was not focused. He clearly forgot what was on the line, or maybe that ADHD was kicking in that day. I'm not sure, but Trey had to snap him out of it. That 700 ain't looking too possible right now. 
After their test, Ricky and Trey go off to see Furious. Furious asks them how they think they did on the test, and of course he also tells them a little known fact. Most of those tests are culturally biased to begin with. The only part that's universal is a math. Message. A little while later, they head off with Furious, and for the life of me, I don't know why Ricky was riding around with a carton of milk. Stomach just sour. <laughs> anyway, Furious shows them a billboard and offers even more knowledge by telling them and the neighborhood teens that walk up to listen about gentrification and how it affects them. He also makes them aware of how drugs are actually getting into the neighborhoods, why there's a liquor store on every corner, gun store on every corner, all these things that are meant to bring out the worst in them, which in turn increases violence, drug dependence, and decreased property value. It's impossible for anything good to come out of circumstances specifically orchestrated so that a particular group of people can fail, period. I love that Furious was never stingy with his knowledge. He willingly shared it with anyone who wanted to listen. But anyway, we go back to Doughboy, Trey, and Ricky chilling at their hangout spot. So as they're chilling and talking, this guy walks by with his crew and intentionally pushes Ricky. And when Ricky confronts him about it, Monster tries to intimidate him, but you already know Doughboy wasn't going for that, so he flashes his gun. And this poor girl, Listen, she tried her best. Can we have one night where there ain't no fight, nobody gets shot? Shut up, bitch. Bitch, I'm gonna fuck you up. See, she really should have just minded her business. <laughs> but anyway, this altercation leads to a disaster later. They decides to give a little preview and shoots up the get together, sending everyone scrambling. So as Ricky and Trey are heading back home, they get pulled over by the cops. And this is where Trey sees a familiar face. Remember the cop from earlier in the movie? Yup, that's him. Still on the same hating ass shit. Just as corrupt as he can be and drunk on pseudo power. And this really gets to Trey. He goes over to Brandy's to calm down, but instead his rage gets to him and he just starts swinging and having a complete meltdown. See, I used to laugh at this scene and a part of me still giggles, but I really do get his frustration realizing that things are the way that they are and there is nothing you can do to change it. That what that cop did, he can continue to do that to him and whoever else because the law and the odds are on his side and there's nothing he can do about it. It's infuriating. And after Trey lets out all his rage, this night out of all nights becomes the perfect time for he and Brandy to have sex. Child, too much was happening at the same time for me. But anyway, Reva and Furious meet up to talk about Trey. And apparently, Trey told Reva that he plans to move with Brandy out of LA. And Reva is not trying to have that. And Furious tries to encourage her to allow Trey to make his own decisions once again. It's clear that Reva is having a hard time letting go. But when Furious tries to end their convo and walk away, Reva gets him together real quick. What you did is no different from what mothers have been doing from the beginning of time. But don't think you're special. Maybe cute, but not special. Drink your cafe all day, it's on me. Child, I definitely see how they ended up together. She kept him on his toes. <laughs> anyway, we go back to Doughboy and his homeboys. As they're chilling on the porch, they spot car sitting in the street. It's clear that he's trying to intimidate Doughboy, but of course, Doughboy makes it very clear that all he ever needs to do is run up and get done up, and Monster eventually goes about his way. Shortly after, Trey walks over and Ricky's inside watching TV. Shanice calls out to him to go to the store and get some cornmeal. After she has to beg him a couple of times, he finally gets up to go do it. As he steps on the porch, he asks Doughboy to go to the store for him, and it was an immediate no. Doughboy swiftly reminded him that his girl asked him to go, and since that's his family, then that's his responsibility. When Ricky cusses him out, Doughboy tries to set him straight. Looking back, Ricky was being a dick. And Doughboy was probably irritated with what was going on with 
and the events from the night before. So it escalated pretty quickly. And then what made it worse was that Brenda came out and immediately took Ricky's side and slapped Doughboy. Yet again, showing who she favored. Listen, Brenda was horrible. But as Ricky walks away, his test scores arrive. Brenda tries to call him back, but he keeps walking. And while him and Trey head to the store, Ricky tells him how he's thinking about going to the army. And Trey tells him what his dad told him about the army, how a black person has no place in it, and he won't get anything out of it. But Ricky doesn't strike me as a critical thinker, so I'm pretty sure all of this was going in one ear and out the other. But as they're walking back home, Ricky and Trey are spotted by they make a run for it through an alley, and child, Ricky must have been stressed because he had to relieve himself immediately. Baby, now is not the time. You need to be running. Forget your bladder. But then he gets the not so bright idea for them to split up, and then he insinuates that these guys, the same ones that just scared the literal piss out of him, are not going to do nothing, and they just playing. Child. But Trey listens to him and they don't even make it out the alley before Ricky gets got. His ass was so focused on the damn scratch offs. Dude, you are in literal danger and you worried about scratch offs. This dude was not bright at all, bruh. Anyway, while all this was happening, Doughboy saw creeping and was heading over to get Trey and Ricky, but he finds them too late and Ricky is officially gone. So they carry him home and baby, when Brenda laid eyes on her golden child, it was a wrap. And this poor baby probably didn't even know what was going on, just hearing all this screaming. And of course, Brenda automatically blames Doughboy. Listen, I have never been so frustrated watching a scene in my life. I'm saving it for the final thoughts, but we gonna discuss Miss Brenda. But child, Trey is raging. He told Doughboy to meet him in five minutes and he heads home to get a gun. Brandy tries to talk to him, but he's not hearing her. His dad tries to talk some sense into him and for a moment, Furious thinks that he's gotten to him. But child, Trey pulled a fast one and he was out of there. Later on, we see Trey riding with Doughboy and his homeboys. As Furious is juggling his steel balls, we see Trey get some sense out of nowhere and request to get let out the car. Them steel balls must have held some power or something. I don't know. But Doughboy continues looking for Monster and his crew. When his homeboys request to get something to eat, it leads them straight to And you already know it was a wrap for him and his homeboys. And it was, in fact, their last meal. How you gonna kill somebody and you eating all out in the open? Like you ain't wanted out in these streets. The hell? But Doughboy ensures that is no longer a problem. And that's that for him. Honestly, we don't give Ice Cube enough credit. He's such a good actor. He did this part justice. But Trey finally makes it home and his dad is relieved that he hasn't done anything that he will live to regret or get put in jail for. His lessons came in handy and his son made the right choice. So the next day while Trey's sitting on the porch eating, Doughboy walks over to talk to him and lets him know that he knows why he got out the car and he understands and doesn't hold it against him. Doughboy goes on to say how he didn't even see his brother on the news, and it's then that he realized something very important. Either they don't know, don't show, or don't care about what's going on in the hood. He realized that his brother was just another body on the street, not worthy of news coverage or attention. And then this line. I ain't got no brother. Got no mother neither. She loved that fool more than she loved me. Listen, Doughboy deserved more. He really did. But unfortunately for him, his actions led to a deadly reaction, and we learned that just two weeks later, he was killed. Why was I tearing up at the end when he was walking away and I saw him fade out? My sensitive ass. Anyway, but we also learned that Trey and Brandy left LA for Atlanta. Brandy went to Spelman and Trey attended Morehouse. And that's pretty much the end of the movie. So here are my final thoughts. Even though Trey was considered the main character of this movie, I really do feel like Doughboy, Brenda, and Ricky were the meat and potatoes of it. I have a lot to say when it comes to those three, so I'll save that for the end. So for now, let's talk about Trey. 
Trey was a blessed kid. He had two stable, emotionally mature parents who worked together to give him a stable upbringing. Contrary to popular belief, I do believe that the parents don't have to be together to raise a well-rounded, healthy, and happy child. When the parents are mentally stable and healthy and present healthy behaviors, the child will thrive. Furious and Reva taught Trey the reality of the world, taught him accurate history which made him more advanced and aware than his peers. This also led him to act out in school since he wasn't being challenged and what they were trying to teach, he already knew it wasn't the truth, which made him uninterested. And this is a popular thing that happens in schools where black students or other students of color are automatically assumed to be troublemakers and punished instead of getting to the root of their actions or finding out the why. There's layers to that, I know, but it still fits. And y'all, when that teacher had the complete audacity to call Reva and insinuate that she was uneducated or that Trey didn't have a dad, child, why was that the first thing to come out of her mouth? Listen, I loved how Reva could lean on Furious to help lead and raise Trey, but I also loved how she pointed out how him doing his fatherly duties was what he was supposed to do, and he wasn't doing anything more than she had done, so he wasn't deserving of some special medal. He was a parent just like her. They taught Trey well, and in the end, he made the right decision for himself. That guidance that Trey had with his parents was not something that Doughboy and Ricky had, but it was definitely needed. Both Ricky and Doughboy's dads were not in the picture. Apparently, Brenda hated Doughboy's dad, which led her to resent Doughboy, but she was more fond of Ricky's dad who wasn't there. Maybe he passed on. They don't really say. The way Brenda treated Doughboy, constantly telling him that he was just like his daddy, how he was never going to be anything, constantly drilling into him negative thoughts. and I mean, what did she expect? How can greatness come from constant negativity and from your own mama? And then Ricky wasn't any better. Dude had a whole baby, was not the brightest tool in the shed, didn't take school seriously. The only thing he had was football. I truly believe Doughboy would have thrived if he had received the same support as Ricky. And low key, Doughboy had more sense than Ricky. He loved to read and was very aware of the world. And even though his mom treated him awful, he never took that out on Ricky. He was a, ve he was a good big brother and looked out for him. He knew his mom was the problem, not Ricky. Most people would not have the emotional maturity to figure that out. I believe Ricky was lost, doing what others thought he should be doing. He really didn't have a plan for himself or his family. All his eggs were in one basket. However, I wonder what would have happened if he wouldn't have passed. Would he have eventually went pro or graduated college? What would life look like for him and his family? I wonder how Brenda felt about losing both her sons so close together. Did she regret how she treated Doughboy? Ricky was her ticket out, and with him gone, I wonder what life looked like for her, Shanice, and Ricky's son. But anyway, y'all, that's it for this review. This review will be on Spotify per usual. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys next time. As for the next review, all I'm going to say is another Hughes Brothers classic with two very familiar faces. Yeah, y'all already know what it is. Anyway, bye.